Moving on with Unit 4, and we're still looking at ideology, but now we're looking at factors that impact uh, political socialization. And political socialization just means like how do we get our political ideology? Where, where do we get that? Um, how does that develop? Um, or obviously we're not like born with it, um, we're socialized. So we're going to look at the factors that um, indicate our socialization politically. All right, so 4.10 factors that impact political socialization. And any time if I'm going to quickly pause and go ahead. All right, um, so how do we develop political attitudes? That's the question that we have here. How do we develop political attitudes? Write that at the top of the back side of the card. We're going to have five major factors that indicate uh, that uh, that influence our political attitudes. So here we go. This is going to be really fast. Um, one and the number one issue, the number one factor in your political attitudes are your family, your mother, father, grandparents. Um, if they're if they're liberal, the chance that you will be liberal is very high. If you come from a conservative family, the chance that you're conservative is very high. Now, by the way, this doesn't always isn't always the case. It is just the number one factor in um, why you develop your political attitudes, influence of family. Two, schools. Schools impact political attitudes. Um, of course, that would include teachers, but also peers. In fact, uh, peers get their own separate um, number here, their own separate uh, uh, point. Awesome. So peers, schools, um, media. Uh, media is a huge influence, and we'll talk about media more uh, in the next unit, but uh, social media is pretty huge, YouTube, um, and, and, and sometimes it's very subtle, like you don't even realize you're being politically influenced, but certain news has a bent to it, um, certain TV shows, social media have a political bent, and that influences your political opinions. And then, of course, um, another pretty major factor would be social environment. The civic, community, and or religious organizations that you would you are involved in, and of course, religion um, has a huge impact on voting. It's a very big predictor of your voting habits. And typically, people that attend church, typically not always, but they tend to lean more conservative. All right, so those are all pretty big influences on our political attitudes. We're moving on to the next card, and that is demographic information and how that impacts our ideology and how we vote. Demographic information, 4.11. First, we've got to define what demographics are. And demographic information, if you fill out, if you have to take an AP test or SAT, you have filled out demographic information about yourself. So what is that backside? It's your age, race, <clears throat> gender, religion, marital status, occupation, education level, all of those things are demographics. And they do, uh, political scientists can look at demographics and, and we tend to see people leaning one way or the other. Now, again, none of this is exact science. I mean, obviously someone could be, you know, a certain age and race and religion or gender or whatever, and they still vote different than the, the norm. But we're just talking here about trends. What is it? trend. And, and there are some trends that we can learn when we look at demographics. Um, and they do influence how we tend to vote. Again, tend to vote. I'm not trying to put anybody in a box or neither are political scientists, but you can learn. Um, and they identify with a political party. I just to use a really funny one is just like, what type of vehicle do you drive? If you drive a pickup truck, it's a very high likelihood that you vote Republican. But if you're driving a Prius, there's a pretty high likelihood that you vote um, Democrat. Now, that's not always true, but I'm just saying, like, there's a pretty high trend to that. There's even trends with TV shows that you watch. And then there's a trends um, that one way or the other. And just a real quick example. Here's income levels. This is a 2016 uh, vote. And you can see that under 50,000, there's a slight trend toward Hillary Clinton, the Democrat. But between 50 and 100,000, which would be kind of more like middle class, there was a trend toward President Trump. And then here's the interesting thing. Over 100,000, it's basically even. There's a, tend there's a trend and there's a tendency in America to think that rich people are much more Republican. And in reality, that's not true. Um, as a matter of fact, as time has passed here in the last 20 years, poorer people are trending more Republican and rich people are starting to trend more Democrat. The, the, the uh, differences are changing there. 
Okay. Um, here's an example of uh, men and women. And so you can see that on the left hand side, men uh, in blue were more likely 53% voted for Donald Trump, 41% voted for Hillary Clinton. But on the female side, on the right, you could see 54% of women voted for Hillary Clinton and 42% voted for Donald Trump. So you see there's kind of a men tend a little bit toward the Republican Party and uh, women tend toward the Democrat Party. And then here is uh, how did non-college age educated women vote? So this is non-college educated women. And under black women, 95% for Hillary Clinton, 3% voted for Trump. That's pretty overwhelming. Um, Non-white women in general, 81%. Hispanic women specifically, 70%. But white women voted for Hillary Clinton, only 34%. And 62% of non-college -edu non educated white women voted for Donald Trump. So you can see um, gender, ethnicity, um, income level does tell us something about how you would vote. In victory, uh, Trump won whites by virtue of the same margin as Mitt Romney in 2012. So you can see here black, um, Hillary Clinton won blacks by 80%, plus 80%. But uh, but the year before, in uh, 2012, uh, President Obama won blacks by 87%. So that actually Donald Trump did better among blacks in 2016 than did Mitt Romney. Hispanic voters, plus 44% um, voted for uh, Barack Obama in 20, 2012, but Donald Trump actually did better because uh, Democrats only were plus 36 among Hispanics. So he actually did better among Hispanics than did Mitt Romney in 2012. And then you can see among white people, it's basically the same, 20% uh, Republican plus, and then Trump was 21%. So you could say that one of the reasons Trump did a little bit better than Romney was his he did a little bit better um or in democrats did worse among blacks and hispanics that that's maybe a surprising result probably for a lot of people to think about um and then um huge gaps among whites uh you can look here some college education it was republican plus eight and then college graduate or more it was democrat plus nine so if you were college educated you're more likely and you're a white person you're more likely to have voted democrat but if you were not college educated you are much more likely to vote republican but notice how historically uh, democrats did very well among some college or less in the in the 92 96 election uh, bill clinton won that demographic and so anyway very interesting statistics here Oh, that was all voters, I should say. White voters are on the right. It's much bigger. Um, some college educated uh, on the on the right here for white voters barely voted Democrat, but uh, big numbers for Republicans um, on the right side among white people. And then lastly, a presidential vote by religious attendance. If you went to church once a week, you voted 40% Clinton, 56% Trump. At least once a uh, monthly, you were slightly 49, 46 Clinton, uh, uh, Trump, I should say. If you just went a few times a year, you know, you weren't that serious about church, slightly Clinton. And then look at if you never went to church, 62, 31 Clinton. So the biggest demographic that's going to vote Democrat are people that never go to church. And the group that's going to uh, vote Republican the most are people that go to church once a week. So that's a pretty big indicator. Now notice 40% of people who go to church every week still vote Clinton. So there's some pretty still significant numbers of people, but we're talking about trending here, trends. Last topic of this um, lesson, uh, globalization. Globalization has kind of changed how people view the world and thus how they vote. 4.12 globalization. First, let's define globalization. Globalization is the growth of interconnected world economy and culture. And this maybe has even become more important as we look at the influence of the Chinese government. There's been um, recent um, controversies over TikTok and the fact that the, potentially the Chinese government is collecting information on users. Um, also, the spread of, of course, the coronavirus um, has kind of made people question our relationship with China um, some in, in, because China maybe isn't being as honest as it could about some of the problems that they're having. Um, but this is also globalization has also led to lowered, lowered trade barriers, meaning lower tariffs. So that way trade would increase. And generally, we see trade as a good thing, but some people are starting to really question that, and that's kind of changing political beliefs. 
Um, communication technology has massively changed the interconnectedness of the world because we can literally talk to anyone around the world um, very quickly due to uh, you know media and cell phones and, and FaceTime and all the different technology improvements. And then um, there's so many other uh, influences of other nations on the United States. And I just mentioned the, the growing influence of Chinese businesses and the Chinese government and people questioning, like, is that a good relationship or not? Um, and so that's, that's a growing, a growing issue. Uh, you know, the NBA has been in China and there was a, a, a story that came out recently about that ESPN reported how the NBA had a, a camp there and actually the Chinese were, were abusing a lot of the players there. So, the NBA is trying to get into the market of China, but by by getting into the market in China, that brings up some questionable practices of the Chinese government in in the uh, the role of the NBA in that. So these are things that people people are starting to question politically, and then and then ultimately the question comes down to this politically: How involved should the U.S. be around the world? And in in just recent years, this has really kind of changed the two parties. Generally speaking. Um, the Democrat Party historically has been the party of we want less U.S. influence around the world. Um, however, Donald Trump, who used to be a Democrat, ha- kind of has that traditional Democrat value of like, let's let's stay out of the world, a little more isolationist. However, now he's brought that into the Republican Party. And the Republican Party that used to be much more like, let's be involved in the world, is now starting to become a little more isolationist. And so you see how like one political figure can kind of change the views of people. And almost as a reaction to Donald Trump becoming a little bit more isolationist, now all of a sudden Democrats are becoming more believers in free trade and interaction with the world. So politics changes people's views and sometimes as a reaction to someone they don't like, um, but also the people change their views on something just because of the leader of the party. So you know, how involved should the U.S. be around the world politically is a question that's going to always be um, front and center of the, the political parties. All right, great. Um, that's globalization. Make sure you study demographics as well. Thank you.